came from a very Salafi mindset and tradition mm. understanding. Right. Follow the Quran, Sunnah, right. like whatever is the truth kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, at some point when we actually started studying, yeah. you realize like, hold on a second. It's like Quran, Sunnah, according to whose interpretation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most of our rhetoric is just basically cosmetic. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, I mean, just to, just a straightforward for the average person is build your, build your knowledge base from some substance. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, like, what, what, do you, have you studied fiqh? Have you studied aqidah, like, from a sound solidifying source? And the, the reality is no, the vast majority of Muslims have not. The literacy of Arabic should be, like, normalized. I mean, our children should be knowing Arabic like, like it's nothing. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Sultans and Sneakers. I'm your host, Mahinda Podcaster, and on today's show, I'm honored to have Sheikh Hasib Noor, longtime friend who I haven't seen in a while in my house for recording. Sheikh Hasib, man, uh, thank you for coming through. Welcome back to Chicago. Yeah, it's, like, it's good to be back, man. Good to see you again. Good to see the family, the kids growing. It's nice. Yeah, I think when I um, came for Umrah, that time we had connected there, my oldest was like a three-year-old and my right. middle one was in my wife's belly. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now I see all three of them. Yeah, it's like three of them now, right, right. For I'm, sure, for sure. I'm but like... what brings you to Chicago? Uh, so I came here to, of course, teach a class on the lives of the Khulafa Rashidin, so sure. Abu Bakr and Omar. Yeah. Uh, and then the idea is to teach all of them eventually. So we came okay. here to teach, inshallah. I got you, I got you. Okay. Now, you're still doing the whole living in Medina primarily. Right. And how often... Are you in the U.S.? Uh, it's about three to four months. So okay. right now I'm teaching uh, in communities in Michigan. Okay. Uh, like an intensive, essentially, almost like an associate's program on Islamic literacy. So okay. we provide like making sure that everybody understands the sciences. Right now I'm teaching Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Fatih, Surah Al-Baqarah, and uh, Riyadh Salihin and Fiqh. I got you, I got you. In your um, travels in the, in the United States, do you travel? Do you do anything in the UK or Australia? Or yeah. So I travel. I mean, to the UK at least once a year. Okay. And then uh, Australia. I, I was pre-COVID and set to go soon. So I mean, I travel pretty much Canada, the US, uh, the Western kind of Western Muslim hemisphere, if you want to say. It. What is your uh, assessment of, I guess, priorities for knowledge, right? Um, like UK versus Australia versus America, if if there is any difference there or because I because from us you know you always have this like UK American Muslim hmm. dichotomy which I actually um did an interview with Dr. Salah Sharif right, three, right you know yeah. uh recently you know a few months ago and right. I and I told him that I don't feel the UK American comparison is appropriate hmm. because the demographic is so different right you know what I'm saying um and I thought that it would be more adept uh suited for the UK to compare themselves to like South Africa Right. Example, you know, as an example. Yeah. So, but like priority wise, um, wh what do you think their fo the communities are focusing on? And also like, what do you think they should be focusing on? I mean, like you said, the, the comparisons are very interesting. Demographics are different. History yeah. obviously impacts a lot of that. Right. Environment has a lot to do with it. Um, I mean, you're, you're originally from Bangladesh, right? Right. So I have a lot of Bangladesh friends. I, I mean, that's the bread and butter of, of the communities I go to a right. lot there. Sheikh Hassan Ali, Sheikh mm -hmm. Zahir, all of them. So uh, one of the most interesting things is that, of course, the 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 way that the societies are set up impacts yeah. the Muslim community the most. Right. How Muslims got there itself yeah. is a whole different story because right. you have like sixth generation like Muslims there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like right. those who actually worked in the factories that, that fed uh, World War One weaponry. Like mm -hmm. they, they were there in, in Sheffield and yeah, Leeds. Right. I mean, I met all those families. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, a, there's a storied um, uh, Curry Trail or Curry Road in almost like major, most of these major cities, which the right. Bangladesh community has massive impact. Right. In London as well. Recently, the king mm -hmm. like went to the specific area of uh, uh, Indo-Pak and South Asian restaurants in London to right. show his almost like, you know, uh, respect that yeah. you guys like what they put back in the community. Mm -hmm. So it was a big deal. Muslims are very much entrenched, ingrained into the society and chicken tikka masala is the main dish of the country, dude. Okay. So it's a complete difference in the sense of the, the Muslims in the moral fabric as well as the impact they have on society just is just widespread. Interesting, because I've always felt like from afar that based on the rhetoric that comes out of England is that they're almost, you know, anti-British, that makes sense? So that's, that's the one thing. I mean, like the anti-colonial colonization movement uh, and rhetoric and narrative, I think sometimes does not speak for some real 
I think realities of people that live live there. Okay. I'll give you a simple example. When sure. I first went to the UK, uh-huh. I actually decided not to go to the most of the major organizations and big massage. Mm-hmm. I went to the smaller ones and some of the more grassroots. Sure. And what I found is there's such a huge dichotomy between the conservative practice yeah. practicing circles mm-hmm. versus the rest of the, like 90% of Muslims. There's such a huge divide of mm-hmm. their even worldview and experiences. So, for example, if you go to East London and you see the areas where the where the enclaves of Muslims are, and essentially where they all live together closely, it's different from just a few streets down mainstream uh, London. You see Muslims there doing whatever. So the funny thing is, like, I, I kind of joked with them. I said, it's kind of very hard there because you have to pick, like, what you follow. You have a pub, and then two two streets down is a masjid. So as you're walking, the hotels are like next to pubs and everything. Yeah, you'll see Muslims in the pubs and all kinds of stuff. Right. So it's like. Yeah, you either live halal or haram. There's no like half and half almost kind of thing. I meant it as a joke. But the idea being is like, I think that um, there is sometimes caricaturization of the, of the society. Muslims in the UK and the way we see it on Twitter and social media is not a very indicative of people who actually like very much are in, in British society. Right. And they're, they're like ingrained in every facet from... I mean, secret, even no matter what you want to say, the secretaries and whatever yeah, they the are, ma- right? The mayor, right? Yeah, yeah. the mayor of London. I mean, this this this, this is a big deal. Right. Uh, but remember that we're looking at them and our disagreements and all kinds of stuff. I'm not I'm not worried about the political yeah, aspects. Yeah. I'm looking at everyone then down. Yeah. And their involvement in society mm. is is very much. And there's not a person you meet except like who live in the big cities because in the, in the smaller cities, this is the main problem. Uh, a lot of people, will, uh, when um, Corbyn lost, they were kind of like shocked at how badly he lost. Because remember that Muslims are very much in the big cities. Yeah. But you're talking about the rest of the UK, which you have all these small, like, you know, pretty much people who've never met brown people kind of thing. Right. Uh, and there's, there's much more of that. Right. Um, it's very difficult to kind of like, obviously, speak about one, one aspect of it. But m- my whole point of mentioning this is that I think the Internet just like it does not speak for the political spectrum, yeah. does not even speak for the Muslim realities. But isn't the same, isn't that the same thing in America though, in the, in the UK, like as far as like, so I, I just got back from uh, the Al-Maqasid retreat. Have you heard right. of it? Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, yeah, in, Sheikh Yahya, mashallah, is doing amazing work. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is I, I run into him every time in Medina and he doesn't tell me. Really? Okay. Like we just run into each other. And so, like, it's funny, I, I made a friend of mine actually jokingly, there's some truth to this, I made a post about it on Instagram and I'm actually going to maybe do a podcast review about it maybe like on Sunday. He was like, hey man, it sounds like you converted to Islam. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. Yeah. But like, I told him, I was like, I told some brothers that I came back and, you know, say what you want. I mean, people like, you know, right. I'll, I'll put disclaimers out there for right. people who are, because there's one brother after two days, he couldn't handle it. He left. Or, yeah. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Mm-hmm. It can be. But for me, it was almost like the feeling I got after coming back from Hajj. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Because when you're immersed in an environment, but... You're like, this is bubble. And I, so I have a friend who um, recently left the community, not mm-hmm. for any bad reason, but it was almost like he was telling me like, man, this has been great for my kids, but they don't know anything else. Mm-hmm. And they don't even know how normal Muslim kids act. You get know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, And I know what he's talking about. It's, it's sheltered, mashallah. Because when I went there back in June right. for like, um, I was there for work and I and you, you see these kids, like these normal kids that will be, the one, you know, baby's kids running around our normal massage. They're the ones sitting over you tea. They're picking it up. They're like kissing nice. your hand. Yeah. I was like, because they're it's like, like five or six year old. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. You I know see. what I'm saying? I exactly. That's some people could say it's like a cult, but I'm like, I mean, obviously, you know, there seems to be something there. Like when I, when, when I met like Sheikh Yahya's son, mm. um, I was like, this kid's probably like 15, 16 years old. Mm. I don't think I've met a, I don't remember meeting a 15, 16 year old with so much noor. Not emanating sure. from him not like sure. and i'm probably probably thinking like well he like i asked him because he's the one i realized was doing he leaves all the atkar yeah right so that's all you're doing and i think that's the environment so my kids even come back and they're doing it right sure. so i'm like sure. and that was only for a week yeah, yeah so but then you think about like that's one enclave right. in the middle of like well, exactly. our pennsylvania right, right right and now you got all of everything could, else everything else right right 100 so same thing you know so it, it, there's no difference it's more like you know, you have, I feel like the creme de la creme is existent everywhere throughout the yeah, world. 100%. Right? Yeah. And you're always going to have, because like little, like the more assimilated folks or people who are just like, Islam is just a cultural identity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So with that being said, um, what are the, when you meet people from all over like the world, especially, let's talk about guys, right? Right. Between the ages of 35 to 45, that's like um, 
our demographic, both right. of us are in that demographic. I think, you know, we came up um, during this phase. We got, wh- when did you get interested in like studying Islam? Was that like big nineties for you or like? Yeah, I mean, nineties was the start and then like 2000s kind of like more, more in depth, but nineties was kind of like. What year did you go to Medina? Uh, 2008. Okay. And that was, did you do, did you do undergrad here first? Yeah, so I studied undergrad here, but back then you couldn't defer. So I was in my third year yeah. about to enter my specialization. I was pre-med and then, you know, I switched, wanted to get into either PA or nursing. Right. And, um, and then right before I got into that, yeah. I got my acceptance letter. Okay. So And this was, is before you had, you had to go before your 25th birthday, right? Uh, no, no, no. B- back then I was 25. Yeah. Uh, but still it was, it, it was go or don't go. Now there's deferral, like you can, Oh really? Dude, there's gap years even, stuff like that. That's now. why you meet, like now you're meeting like Medina guys who are like in their mid thirties. Yeah. But Under but that, those are exceptions still. Okay, so I think thirty is the guy, is the is the hit off now. Or well, because I, I I did an interview with uh, Imam uh, Tom Fakini. Right, like, about a year. Tom's a good friend. You know, 15, he came after ago, me. Yeah, fifteen months ago, right? Yeah, and I was I think it came up this whole age thing, right? Because right, right. he's he's a he's not a young dude. He he was no, undergrad not. first, right? Yeah. And he kept saying he's like he's like the only rule in Saudi. Is that there there's no, no rules, rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. and there's exceptions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, he was actually my bunk mate at Makassid. Oh, nice, Kind of his family was. So they, we shared oh, like no, a whole bunk, and there's like it's separated with the um the bathrooms are separate. There's yeah. like a curtain stuff, but yeah, yeah we five private because it's like a campsite, right? Of so, course, of course. You know when you have like family of five, you know, th- th- you know you, you get a you, you can upgrade a little bit. You know what I mean? Well, it was nice. It was nice to see him, but first cool. first time I met him actually in person, but yeah. yeah so he was just like. So, so yeah, back when you're coming up, mm. um, you know, I guess, you know, our rate, because we have the conversation we've always had sometimes like, okay, back then we used to take weekend seminars, classes, guys used right. to study before we were married, right? Right. Then we get married and it like, it's almost like we only went to classes to meet sisters, mm. <laughs> right? Mm. I don't know if that's true or not, but sometimes it's like, we were active Different. in MSA Different, right. to meet sisters. Right, right. Um, we were single, you did that. And then all of a sudden, like dudes get married before even kids sometimes. And they, right. maybe they're doing their, them and their wife are doing something, but sometimes they marry a sister and like, you'll, you'll hear something, a brother will, they'll talk, they'll be talking in premarital talks and they're these like ideals like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're going to study and this and that. And right. then like, I had one friend tell me that like, oh, I think his wife just told him what he wanted, what she, what he wanted to hear. Right. And then like, but she thought she was going to push, but it's like, you've never immersed yourself in that environment. All of a sudden right. Right. you just can't like cold turkey do it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was different. I mean, one of this, I think realities was there's idealization in yeah. some essence right. and romanticism in mm-hmm. many ways, mm-hmm. but also like the Muslim scene kind of, there's, there's real social realities that we kind of re- came to, came to terms yeah. with. Um, and I think part of that is, has, has to do with, um, I think a lot of t- a lot of times the 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 rhetoric that was taught yeah. was pretty much a particular line, a particular thought process. Right. And a lot of people developed themselves. Mm. People who the speakers who used to have that kind of rhetoric, they themselves developed and evolved. Yeah. And then later on, when we ourselves study, like you know, I've told you this story before, studying in Medina, like yeah, I just realized uh, the first six months, I was kind of just upset. Why? Because I realized that everybody was giving a selectively understood, spoon-fed understanding of Islam from their perspective, okay. the Sufis, the Salafis, everybody. Yeah. I met like, I mean, I'm not gonna mention names in this podcast, sure. but I met, the, I met the teachers of pretty much the main Dawah scene heads of all of the sides. Yeah, right, right. Because Medina kind of like is a place where, you know, all right. the, they, they, that's where you meet, everybody's there. Right. So, and then when you get the process of like, okay, where they come from and what was their understanding and how they were impacted, it was just very interesting uh, to know that the scholars themselves didn't carry that kind of stuff. You understand what I'm saying? There was very much a camaraderie of between like Ashari's and Atharis and like mm-hmm. all that. And um, the differences very much existed. And also you realize that how much of that is social conditioning? How much of it is impacting you and in your interpretation based on who you studied? Mm-hmm. So that is, that, then some of those complexes are also then taught. Yeah. So depending on who, you, who, you, who, who, uh, who teaches you, you're just getting that from your teacher and then you're passing it off to your students. So... There's very much also enclaves in Medina. So every time I would meet people and I would have a discussion with them and they look at, they, they see my perspective, they're like, I remember somebody, like, he's like, I don't believe you. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I've never heard this before because we thought Medina students are a certain way. Yeah. And what I realized is that Medina, and I told everybody this after a while, I realized what the problem was. I would tell them Medina University is one thing mm-hmm. and Medina the city is another, another whole planet. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, the rhetoric and the theology and the, 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 even the fiqh that was taught in some of the, some of the professors in, in, the, in university mm -hmm. uh, kind of did not speak for the tradition of, of, of Medina the city. Right. And what I found is that people just essentially live in that particular environment. And then they, they graduate only having studied with six, seven like major teachers and that's it. They've the never got who they were already preconditioned to some vote. some were, but some were were conditioned into that. They came fresh. There's guys that are like converts. Yeah. What are they being conditioned to? They just thought Medina is the place, right? Some of those guys, when they actually saw that, they were turned off by it. Okay. And they're like, well, this is not the Islam that I know. And they left. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because right. to them, they was just like, this is too harsh. I don't understand. Why the stringency, right? Um, and then others, alhamdulillah, like because they they saw the stringency, they had enough like analysis to say this is not this is not, I'm not jiving with this. So they went right. to other the, the teachers of the city. Right. So Medina is a very big spectrum, just mm -hmm. like the rest of. And do you think this is, is a, a more recent phenomenon? Because people want to no. say they'll see people like Imam Tom or yourself. They a lot of them they like people try to argue people from the outside will say this is post YQ Yale. This Medina. is absolutely not no no no. Since no. like, I mean, if you want to talk about that in particular, Sheikh yeah. Yasser in his development was mm. something that happened. Of course, w when we were was studying with him and yeah. uh, when we were in Medina as well, and we right. saw that development. Right. That was pr and then, to be honest with you, we could I, we could actually map like his own teachers. Yeah. Like who he studied with and whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the things that we came to terms with was was pre that whole that whole okay. coming out. Mm -hmm. But remember, like we don't have a public platform to come and, and yeah. essentially, and we were taught not to have positions anyway. Right. Like <laughs> it's not it's not it's not a time for you to have pub make public positions. Yeah. yeah right. So um, one of the things I actually realized is this is not it has nothing to do with what was exposed to the public. It's very much been the tradition in Medina for for ages. Interesting. It's it's, it's always been like. Well, this. I, I guess. Do you know? I guess there you have someone like Zamir Sattar. Do you know him from New York? From uh, he's from the eighties. Yeah, 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 Zamir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, know yeah. Him, yeah. Uh, from Muhammad. Yeah, yeah so yeah, it's very much uh, like a, a traditional of, yeah, yeah. Uh, tr uh, tradition. Yeah, from, from, but he's from the Medina guy from the eighties. So yeah. it's like because you, I, I think there's this automatic perception that like, like I asked Imam Tom, I was kind of like, because when I first saw him at the Makassar retreat, right. I was like, the double take. Even though I knew he was not not as hard line, you know, your typical guy. But then I was like, first of all, I was like, I gotta commend you for like, um, you know, coming because mm. first of all, you know, people, it's rare to find imams or scholars attend other programs as an attendee, right. um, just for the sake of attendance. Yeah, yeah, of course. Usually they're there, but they're like, oh, they're gonna put me up as a guest speaker and stuff like that. Yeah, that's always you just want to benefit sometimes. You know, sometimes right. <laughs> right. He's like, he's he's there with his family. He just wants to do his thing. And I'm like, I'm like, hey man, I gotta put you on. I gotta put you up because right. like no one knows who you are here. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Um, Sheikh Yahya knows you. He yeah. knows him and stuff. But like, um, but like in my head still, like, cause you have that framework, like the Islamic University of Medina. How do you have people like you know? Th there's others who come out of Omakura who like you right. meet them. You're like. Oh, it's, yeah, we're still dealing with this baggage of like, oh, you're from Saudi and stuff. You, but, but, but going back to the topic of like knowledge for us. Right. That, cause, cause you, were you an Al Maghrib student before Medina? Yeah. Okay. So I, I pretty much came from a very Salafi mindset and tradition yeah. understanding. Right. So, I mean, that for us, we were, we didn't really have like the camps that you see and et cetera. We were just like, Follow the Quran, Sunnah, right. like whatever is the truth, kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, at some point, when we actually started was studying, yeah, you realize like, hold on a second, it's like Quran, Sunnah, according to whose interpretation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then the whole idea of understanding tradition and understanding like, yo, there's 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 lines, there's thoughts. Yeah. Again, social conditioning with some group, some movement, some ideology. So no, no matter who was teaching you, it's you that that person is socially conditioning you to something. But is that something you picked up on your first six months there? Yeah, hundred percent. Is that in the Mahad? No, this is some. This is me exposing myself to the teachers of the city, outside of outside of the system, outside of the university, outside of the the whole city is full of ulama. Right. Like mm. you know, it's but like I guess what made you because so many people. So I want to ask you. A, there is a um, I heard this is a quote that comes up a lot. People like this is honest. This is genuine, by the way. This is not like someone just being pejorative. Right. They were like. I would rather just be safe because I don't want to be asked about it on the day of, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they, so they're coming from the frame of that whatever they've learned is the safe thing, right? Anything else is, yeah. so they don't want to expose themselves to anything else because they're just like, 
I'm afraid of learning something incorrect. And then, yeah, there's a lot of real fear of like, because there's not a lot of people just don't understand what does a spectrum mean? The right. spectrum of validity. Yeah. So there's a spectrum of validity in Islam. It's right. called khilaf sa'ir. Sure. Right? What's, what's, what's valid. Right. So as long as we, when you're in the with valid fold, you're good. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're okay. Right. And you're practicing Muslim, you're praying your prayers and you're right. doing your thing. Right. But one of the things is that people just, I think generally all over America, everywhere in the world, yeah. they just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And the advent of YouTube and all this other stuff has, has made it even more difficult to, to navigate. Because there's chaos. It's, it's not only chaos, it's just the people that are speaking are just adding to just the insanity rather than actually solving problems. Mm -hmm. Where's the foundation being built, right? And you have people who are not, they're not qualified, they haven't studied, and now they're what, what I call resume packing or just going back to appeal to authority, going back now to get their degrees and stuff like that with pretty much they've already you know, have their opinions. They just want to now have a name behind it, right? Sure. So we have a lot of this going on and even having discussions with some of these people, like straightforward, you know, mm -hmm. private, et cetera. I mean, I've told people you, you can't take advice. And they say, yeah, I can't. You, Be they can or they, they cannot. They say, I cannot. And uh, I'm, I'm just saying like, the the whole adab the whole realm the whole like the the personas the egos that are driven and, if, and they say follow the money like i don't know if you if if you've seen how much if if they were to have advertising costs how much these people are making right so there's a lot of there's a lot going on beside the clout beside people just egging you on in the wrong direction mm -hmm. some people are just not studied very well as much as they think they are as well okay so sometimes the conclusions are premeditated right mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the conclusions conclusions are like half baked and it, it shows very much so when somebody hasn't taken the time to just sit and, and, and really go into something very deeply to then publish a conclusion on it. Because look, you, you know this, we have our own peer review systems by via, we have groups of just like graduates upon graduates of just like talking to each other. Right. Before I put something out, I actually run it by a, a few people and right. there'll be a back and forth. Yeah. It'll be like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get, we're going to get into it. Right. But from what I'm seeing is like a lot of these guys, they're just not approachable. One of them. Um, so for me, like just because the headache of the whole thing, I don't listen to most of the like dawah, that's stuff that's being put out in English. Yeah. It's just like, I, I, I don't really find a benefit of substance there. It yeah. just seems like cosmetic issues that are being dealt with. Right. Um, I went and tried to study like a, the, a contemporary theology series that, that, that somebody had put out and I found a lot of good in it. And then a lot of also like inconsistencies, you know, it wasn't logical. And that was in English? It was in English. Okay. So it was like, and I was like, okay, let me see how, what, what stuff is out there. Is that, are you studying that because you want to assess what's out there versus, yes. Cause I figured you yourself, you haven't been versed in Arabic would just, you, your primary source would be well, Arabic Well, that's the lecture. thing, because like contemporary theology, man, like all of the books of theology, like the Hawiya yeah. and everything, yeah. bro, they were written for their modern time. Right. So we're, we're contemporizing theology is not just about reading a text in the past. Right. That's what we're thinking. We still yeah. need to read the Hawiya. Like, are you serious? Right. The Hawiya is a, is a foundation of just mm. extremely basic information. Sure. Right. That is then just you know, over extrapolated to kind of see where the contemporization takes place. Mm -hmm. Why are we not writing contemporary theological works? Every one of the works in theology says, this was a letter from such and such place I'm responding to. Yeah. So uh, in, in the process of me studying that, uh, I, I created my own class called Faith Foundations and, mm -hmm. and I taught it once, which is basically how do, how do I conceptualize a modern theological text a modern theological class where people can just understand how do I construct what I believe in Islam. Mm -hmm. So it, talk, it talks about the foundations and belief in God, uh, proving the Quran as the word of God, proving the proof of the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet, and then uh, the interpretation factor. Mm -hmm. How do we know what interpretation is valid and invalid? So that's why I went, I went through the series. And I found some like massive like um, good in it and also just massive inconsistencies didn't re it wasn't logically progressed in any sense and it's from a student of knowledge yeah i mean a person who studies and a student of knowledge and okay. claims that he's a person of knowledge but okay. i don't i mean you know his teachers are not that known okay and he studies you know off the side and secular right. studies and all kinds of stuff sure. but, but but my point is i actually wrote some notes down because i was like let me let me just try to you know reach out and you know had some people basically try to reach out to the person is like oh I'm, I'm too busy that kind of thing. I'm just like, bro, <laughs> you're too busy to get some kind of direction in what exactly you need that would benefit people to make this better. It's, I found there's a sense of egoism, bro, in this whole thing. And it's really, it's really toxic because 
when you have that large of a following, alhamdulillah, like we're not saying we have huge followings or whatever, right. but when you have, when you have, we have a lot of people in your ear right. and bigging you up and all kinds of things. What really happens sometimes is just, it becomes um, the main factor that kind of leads you to what you're going to say next. So right. that's where the clickbait and the kind of the, the toxic discussions come But from. I think that's what, that's probably the people who are against that mindset of pre review. That's why they formulate taught like pejoratives like Dawa Mafia. Right. You know, when you're doing, because I, I was actually, I had lunch with uh, Sheikh Yasser today. Right. Gadi, and we were talking about the, uh, the, the whole Navigating Differences document. Right. And he was talking, he was telling us about like the whole, like the six or seven, the original, the main, like primary authors. Right. And they're bouncing it off people. And, right. It, you know, it wasn't like one one person just wrote it and like here, it'll yeah, sign I, off. I remember I got this document even before it was published. Right. It wasn't just a few two dudes sitting together. Yeah, like right. Joint. Yeah, there was a lot of peer review going on, right? Yeah. And so, but now it's like, it's easy because it, you put a label like a pejorative Dawa Mafia or something like that. Like, oh, these guys don't want to listen. It's just easy because the per it's funny because the people who like throw that out there, you probably realize that they're probably not even doing, they're, they're not talking to anybody else. They're doing their own thing. And then it, so then don't be surprised when they start eating themselves. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> thing is, if you're not led by some system of adab, like yeah. uh, Muhammad Naqib al attas talks about this in Islam and secularism. Mm -hmm. He's like, we we have lost as an ummah the sense of adab. And he's like, by adab, I don't mean just relations. I mean, like our overall under, understanding, our frame of thinking. Yeah, It's, it's missing. He's a, that, he calls that adab, all of that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if somebody doesn't come from a solid frame of thinking, a lot of people don't know where to start what to do so they just watch a bunch of youtube videos right right and like let's let's just start and i'm, and I'm, I'm I, one of the things i will add is that a lot of these guys may uh address issues which have truth in it may may be addressing a serious problem at the time whatever right, right. but that doesn't mean you're 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 solidifying or you're edifying or you're building people from some kind of foundation right they don't have foundations to begin with yeah so they're like oscillating in their iman, in their right. faith. There's, there's, not, there's not much there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not much surprised like when we actually see what like a faith community looks like in person, like you were saying like Sheikh Yahya's Maqasid or yeah. any, any faith community. Right. You, you'll start saying like, yo, I've never seen this before. Because <laughs> we've, we've disengaged from that, bro. Yeah. Most of our rhetoric is just basically cosmetic. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, I mean, just to, just to straightforward for the average person is build your build your knowledge base from some substance mm -hmm. and there's you know like what, what do you have you studied fiqh have you studied aqidah like from a sound solidifying source and the, the reality is no the vast majority of muslims have not so let me, let me ask you a blunt question then so like those of us who are in the 35 to 45 range yeah. we were among group students in our early 20s right and like our exposure to fiqh was like a purification of the heart I mean, right, the right. purification act or like right, right, um right. What a light upon light, whatever these classes we had, these right. like credo courses or fit courses, a lot of people are still hanging on to that. Right. Is that sufficient to you? No, I don't think or so. would you revisit or explore it? Maybe, like, how would a, let, let's say I got, I'm, I'm 41, right? Right. I'm 41. I'll tell you, maybe you can case study me, okay? I'm 41. You saw my human, my kids. Right. Um, so my, my thing now is like the thing with, with my 50 hour a week job, my podcast. Right. Um, you know, whatever I got to do for physical exercise and stuff. Right. Um, the only, the thing that I'm consistent, that I hang on to is Arabic. Right. An hour a week, Studio Arabia. Okay. And then if Sheikh Amin has a class in, in, at Dar al Qasim and Tafsir right. on Sundays, um, I saw, I saw your timing. I was like, man, I, I would have, you, you, next time you, next time you got, I'll take it to Dar al Qasim, inshallah. 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 Um, like try to go to his class because he's local. He's a giant right. in North America. And my, my mindset is like, it's only 35 minutes from my house. Right. I mean, come on. Why would you not go? Yeah, right, exactly. Right. I don't want to even zoom it in. It's like, I feel like it's a disservice, right? Yeah, Just go and drive, make the drive, right? Right. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. But I, but I was talking to somebody that like, um, over voice note the other day, it was like, even my creedal stuff, I took Tahawiya, which it comes on Magbu, like, 2016 ish like a weekend course right but i i actually don't know that i've actually gone back and really studied the creed right maybe the way it should be you know what i'm right. saying so it seems like everyone is like and i feel like but i feel like i'm still i'm stretched so, so thin, thin already yeah, yeah, yeah. with what i got going on i understand but i'm but what i'm saying is that i think our our institutions yeah if you look at i mean i'm i'm saying i've looked at their their program mm. and it's not really like it's, it almost seems like we're just doing classes to do classes. It's not like a logically progressed, so, solid 
program where you can say people come out of illiteracy out of this. Yeah. So my thing is if you somebody like you who's so busy and you plugged into a program saying, hey, listen, in, in one to two years, you're gonna have some you're gonna have a basic foundation of literacy in this. My other problem is that we are too ingrained in like the past. We're too ing- ingrained in the mutun, in the texts mm-hmm. of Tahawiya and like this book and that book. It's not like that. I think the development of those sciences are extremely important to talk about. Mm-hmm. The development of the Quranic sciences, the development of hadith sciences, mm-hmm. development of usul al-fiqh, and understanding how that imp- like applies in the day-to-day life of, of, sure. a, of a Muslim. Right. And more importantly, why doesn't every Muslim have or has done a cover-to-cover basic tafsir of the Quran? Why have they not gone through Riyal, uh, 40 hadith and Riyadh salihin mm-hmm. Like these are, this is basic, right? Um, this is the basic I'm talking about. We need to go back to the bread and butter of like the nusus. Every community should have a cover to cover class. Every every community should finish like uh, books of hadith like Arba'een, Riyadh Salihin, Adab al Mufrad, and then going into the Muatta. Couldn't somebody just take like Marif al Quran and just read it themselves? No, man. No? No, no, no. I think what, what you're losing out on is remember that this is a scholar's perspective okay. on, on the tafsir of the Quran. Okay. A true tafsir that's taught now is kind of like what Abu uh, Ismail al Harawi did. In, he was from Herat, from Afghanistan. Okay. He was influenced by Ibn Taymiyyah. And he, he basically said, I went over 100 tafsir before I prepared my dars. Mm-hmm. Dude, like tafsir in our time, uh, whether people are like it or not, there was alhamdulillah, a number of, of the du'at recently which basically. Uh, contemporize the Quran so well to people right. where they actually like felt like hey the Quran is something that I can re- that's relevant to me now sure. it's not a reading of Qurtubi Qurtubi is being translated as you know by D1 Press right mm-hmm. uh, the Bulis mashallah doing a great job um, but my point being is just reading that tafsir is not going to make you understand tafsir contemporizing that is in three levels one of them is understanding the zahir al whatever what the Quran means then understanding the siyak which is understanding this context and then it's tatbiq and that's where reflection comes in mm-hmm. and application. So we don't even have the first or the second, and we're just going to read like well, Ma'arif al Quran. I'm good. Mm-hmm. The reality is, let's say somebody does that. Why don't you read Ma'arif al Quran from beginning to end? Mm-hmm. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, you know, I think there's a very lofty aspirations, but we're talking about just very practical things, cover to cover of the Quran and basic understanding of the Hadith, and giving people practical fiqh. Mm-hmm. We're still very much enclaved in our fiqh uh, schools, right? You have the traditionalists, you have the, uh, the Salafis, mm. and then you have people in between. Like, I don't fit in either camp. We, in reality, we're pro-Medhab, right? 100%, we yep. should be studying a Medhab. Sure. But not confining ourselves to it or a view of the Medhab like the Mu'tamad of uh, uh, one particular uh, time period of the Medhab, like the Muta'khirin or whatever. I don't believe in that. Uh, and this is not what our teachers even taught, in essence. So. They would call us like Salafi in fiqh, but we're not, we're not the Salafi in fiqh that people know. The idea that confining yourself to a madhab absolutely and irrevocably mm-hmm. is a view of like only a group of people. It doesn't mean that this is the only view. Even, like for example, Shatabi rahimahullah has that view where you should stick within the madhab and not go out ever. But this is not the only view. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So the average person, I think, needs a foundation. Yeah. And then needs a teacher to help navigate them. That's it. But it's, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like the teachers either, either it's zero sum games, either, yes. either or. That's, but now you're seeing more of it. Now you're seeing more people who, are, who have now foundation. Because why? The reality is, bro, if you're living in America, you're living in a, what I call a post medhab world. Mm. We're in a post-Madhab world, okay. very much mixed uh, realities. Right. So the, the idea of like, oh, I was born into a Hanafi school, I'm in a Hanafi community, I need to be Hanafi. My question is why? Why? Right. Why not be Hanbali? Because you have access to a Hanbali teacher. Mm. Why not be Shafi? Because you have access, whoever you have access to. Right. You understand? Mm-hmm. But they're like, no, this is going to cause issues, etc. But I'm like, just like, if you ask the average person, it's just, a, it's just like uh, a, a, a nostalgic thing. You know, in, in in some ways, but I feel like as someone who went from who was like no madhab to madhab, right? right I've almost feel like madhab from a point of view, like like as as a follower of Maliki school, right? Like I, you know, there's opinions within the Maliki school right. that there's flexibility in things, right? Exactly, right? Um, you it's not your foot was not shopping, but it does a lot. It allows you to check the nuts. I think I think what happens is that when people are, um, like. I, I just can't get down to this approach that people have. They're like, oh, I'm just going to follow the easiest opinion for everything because it's minority fic. 
Yeah, that's that's a weird understanding to be honest with you. But yeah. there is a view of the usuliyin. Like yeah. uh, Zarkashi mentioned this in Bahr right. Muhil. Okay. Based on the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Khayr and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being a Marine, for Khayr, I said, "Oh, Malik, in the Yakun Ithma, Kabah Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." Sure. Uh, this is a Hadith of Aisha. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was given a choice between two matters, he would choose the easiest as long as it was not a sin. Right. So they actually derive usul from this. Okay. Can a person choose the easiest opinion of the scholars and ulama? They said yes. Mm. But now if you fatwa shop every opinion, thing. easiest so, opinion so for every he, issue. This is, the, this is the thing. Can a person then do this irrevocably? They said as long as they don't follow their desires and fatwa shop in this sense. Yeah. Meaning what? In every single issue, yeah. they're going to choose the easiest because it's the easiest. Right. This is what's considered ittiba al-hawa. But it's also the other extreme which you mentioned earlier. I want to be safe. So some people, what they do is they always choose the hardest because... That they think that this is somehow safer. Yeah. You understand? This is also following your desires. You're following your desires and what you think is the hardest. So if it's hard, then it's real Islam. If it's easy, then it's not. Usually the the safe is more from a point of view of like ibadah like ish like th- th- if there's like gathering of bunches of dikkah or something. That's yeah, kind of stuff. but but what I'm saying is yeah. even in even in cases sure. where, where fuqaha have Ve- like even differed yep. on some issue being bid'ah or not. Okay. It still makes it still valid. Right, right. Just because a group says it's bid'ah does not invalidate sure. the validity of the spectrum. Sure. I mean, things like the mawlid, yeah. things like uh, aspects of, of dhikr. Right. Like, I, I, I attended majalis of, of mashayikh in Medina right. who don't do that. Yep. Right? And those who do. But they also are spectrums as well. You know, like the Hadrami Yemenis, are, their majalis are much different yeah. than the Shamis. Yeah. The Shamis mostly do a nasheed. Right. And they do like uh, reading the hizb of Imam al-Nawi and right. awrad. And the Burda. Right. That's vastly different from the very liturgical, like, uh, chanting of the Yemenis. Or the Hadra. The Hadra, that's what I'm saying. The Hadra. The Hadra is more, but that's like, again, like the Shadleys. The sh- yeah, but, y- but that's what I'm trying to say. There's, yeah. there's such a huge spectrum, right? right? So even then, you have some of the ulama even involved in that. They're yeah. like, we don't feel comfortable with this necessarily. Right. So my, 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 my reality was that, dude, Islam is a big spectrum. Yeah. At the end of the day. Even if you disagree with it. Even if you disagree with it. Like, but, I, I, but, I, but I struggle with the whole idea of like as a lay person, having access to somebody like you, you, you need a very special teacher that can then walk you through all that. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, but that's the, that's the hard thing. Life is, I think, not, not that easy to find a person who themselves has had such diversity in thought Yeah. for them to then teach this to you. Right. <laughs> the reality is every person, every teacher, every teacher, including yourself, yeah. has been socially conditioned by somebody else. Sure. They're in a they're in this chain of social conditioned people. Yep. And you just have to realize the fr- just diversify your your teachers that you take from. Right. And that will eventually give you this perspective. Right. And that's, you've seen this by nature. People get more and more open to understanding. The more hey, you, yeah. We just differ. You know, we're, we love each other. Mm-hmm. We just differ. I have love for for all of the, the those who strive for Islam. Sure. We're just going to differ on some mainstream things. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I remember like th- this this important fact. I think yeah. just will help people. Find a teacher, base your Islam on substance, get through the nusus. Like, study the Quran, yeah. <laughs> study hadith, mm-hmm. and then you'll be all right. Okay, but, but now coming down to like priority, like, so where does, um, do you believe Arabic is optional? I think a portion of it is and a, and a portion of it is not. Okay. I think meaning, understanding the meanings of like the, the prayer and like what yeah. essentially builds your understanding of the Quran okay. is something essential for every Muslim. Right. Right. And then uh, as for the depth, our community's appreciation of our tradition will only be, I think, equated to our appreciation of the Arabic language. Mm-hmm. You understand? Like I go to certain communities and you know, it was funny. I went to one, one place and they're like, we don't want to, we don't want an English lecture. We want it in Arabic. Okay. Okay, so I spoke to him in Arabic, and like they were like, "We don't even believe you're not Arab." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not Arab," but communicating the, the language of the of the Quran was the the was the norm. Right. If you look at Abu Saud's tafsir in, uh, in the, the Turkish uh, alim, right? Mm-hmm. He's Turk, bro. Mm-hmm. But if you when you look at the depth of Arabic knowledge he had, it is mind blowing. Sure. So we have to go to that standard. Everybody should, the literacy of Arabic should be like normalized. I mean, our children should be knowing Arabic like, like it's nothing. So then it's not optional. No, I mean saying it's, it can't be optional for, from, from, a, from, a, 
civilizational perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but as, I, as an individual, I'm not going to force everybody who's like, like you got 50 hour work week. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Like, it's, it's going to be right. But, but when I look at priority, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, okay, so uh, I don't know if you know, have you met uh, Ustad Nus Saunders? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So his big, his biggest thing is Quran, right? Yeah, of course. He's like basically, well, his 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 his, his model is basically like, listen, we have done uh, a disservice by seeing by equating Ahlul Quran with Hifzul Quran. That's hundred percent right? true. Yeah. And therefore, people feel like they're they have they either tried memorizing memorizing they couldn't do right. it, and then they completely disconnected. That's hundred percent right? true. Hundred percent. And true. his emphasis is like. You got to be able to read it properly right. with Tajweed. There's right. a system for it, right? right? And then just get to Ijaza because at least you have a connection. Right. And that's, that'll give you some spiritual benefit right. back to the Rasul right? Yeah. right? Which is a very tangible, specific task. Right. Right. But I'm adding to that. Yeah, you're adding is, that. So, which is Faham al-Quran. Right. And Faham al-Quran is much more important than this, which is understanding the Quran. For, like every Muslim should make it a goal where they understand the entire Quran. Okay. And I think it's tangible. It's, it's, it's called cover to cover. So you would do that over the recitation? No, the, the recit there's it's not mutually exclusive. No, but it's, it, it is in a sense that people have bandwidth for right. only X amount. Like so you prioritize. There's a program. Yeah. So prioritization of yeah. reading the Quran, yeah. which doesn't take long. Like it's a month process, two okay. months like here. Sure. And then over time, you're going to have a teacher you're going to recite to. Right. And this is a regular thing, right? But what are you going to do in terms of your understanding? Sure. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, I make sense because I, it, it seems like a lot of brothers have like been reciting wrong for years, and they just drag it out, and that's just unacceptable. Yeah, they're arguing about things on YouTube videos. Right. You that's them, why. Like, why? Yeah. Give me the tafsir of Fatiha. Right. What's the difference between What's the difference Hamd and Shukr and Thana and Madh? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, bro. So like, these are basic things that every Muslim should understand and sure. know because you say a million times, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Shukru lillah and like, you know, thana Allah, all of these things are, 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 are basic to people. But you, you know, we were talking about this earlier, is like the average, what are the needs of the average, I think that age group of 35 to what, what you said? 45. 45. I think a lot of it has to do also with like social realities. Okay. So a lot of young men who are getting married, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, I just need to know like post-marriage advice. How do I assert myself as a man um, in, a, in, a, in a family? How do I live prophetically, right? And this is something very difficult because the fuqaha don't have this written out. The, 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 the works of, of, of ulama and scholars are not written about the fine details of how you deal with your mother-in-law and your wife. Yeah. And your mom and, 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 diff, and disagreeing with, with, with other things. So those are the, 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 the dailies, right? Yeah. Of how do we navigate? What happens then is we become stuck between a bunch of texts yeah. and what our teachers taught us right. and then trying to apply that with our culture. Okay, yeah. don't ever go, don't ever disagree with your mom, for example. This is a, this is something ingrained in people's head. My mom says something and my wife uh, d disagrees, then I'm just going to stay quiet. And like, you know, they just don't know how to navigate these issues. When, when, uh, and then I'm saying again, from the perspective of a man, because, you know, it, it goes the, the other way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but also, for example, a uh, young man recently, he was, just he was just talking to me, he was recently married, but he's like, um, I don't know, I don't know when to assert myself as a man. And when to use the prophetic kind of like mercy approach where I'm saying like, hey, look, this is the decision we made as a family versus like, okay, honey, I, I understand what you're saying. Let's do some shura on this. You, these, these kind of discussions, the average, the average guy needs some help on because I think those discussions are breaking families. Uh -huh. They don't know how to navigate those things. So when you don't have solid advice from people who have experience yeah. and knowledge to help you navigate it in some way, then it's just, it's, it's, it's causing a lot of family problems. And the divorce rate is high based on this. It has a lot to do with premarital, 100%. I think most of it is premarital. But now we're, we, we need to get into the discussion like, okay, we premarital our, ourselves. Like, I'm teaching premarital seminars, all <laughs> until I'm blue in the face. That's fine. And I think, by the way, the vast majority do not take those seminars, and that's a problem. Okay. But in addition to that, postmarital discussions is very important as well. Navigating family in a prophetic model. How do you do it? Right when there's differences, how how is how are decisions made in the, in in the contemporary Muslim household in America? Right, but a lot of that comes from your upbringing too, right? Culture, your upbringing, yeah. personalities. But that's what I'm saying. It's a mix of things that needs needs direction. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know this. Uh, uh, there's an adjustment period when anybody gets married. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys just need help. They need to be given advice, like mentorship. And if they're not part of communities, they're sitting there on uh, arguing on Twitter and, and etc. Like, bro, a lot of, a lot of the reality sets in is that when you have, when you, when you have, first of all, when you get married and then when you have children, all these discussions like literally dissipate. Yeah. You don't have time. There's no, there's no, they're, they're not even relevant. 
And that's why a lot of people's perspectives and perceptions of Muslim Twitter of like the America versus the UK is just complete nonsense. Like, but it's funny because most of the guys, a lot of guys I know who participate are married with kids. Yeah. Well, I mean, what are they focusing on? That's the thing. Like, you know what I mean? But but I think the um, going back to so like how many of us? So you know, I've been married fourteen years, right? Right. I remember when I first got married, it was like, the, you know, everyone's got the honeymoon phase. Right, right, of course, yeah. You know, six to 18 months or something, right? right, 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 right roughly, right. depending on how, how, well you ha- like, how you play it. Right. I remember his brother, uh, you, I don't think you know Harun Malik. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Harun, uh, uh, you know, Malik by on Instagram, you know, old old friend of mine, uh, Ola Bugger Bamir back in the day, right? Right, right, right. So Harun, I remember when I got married, oh, nine. He was married a few years before me, mm-hmm. right? He already had a kid and everything. He Personal. was like, He's like, man, these are the good, those, those are the, I miss those days, man. Like, right, you're right. living a good life right, right now. Right. I, I didn't know what he was talking about, right? Right, right, right. You know, I was like, okay, until you well, had your own kid, yeah, right. until you, yeah. well, until you, like, get out of the, and I wonder, and I tell people now that, like, the honeymoon phase will go away, but, like, don't get in the bad habits during the honeymoon phase, mm. if that makes sense, right. right? But at the same time, our parents did not coach us right. on this what you what you what you alluded to is a, is like when to be assertive, when to push back. The whole Jalali Jamali, right, right, right. You know, and there are people who are working in the in the field now, right. Um, now coaching guys for that kind of stuff, right. Um, Muslim Muslim dudes, uh, like I know there's um, like the the the, the there's a the becoming Rujul love program being run out of Canada, right, right. There's some brothers in that program. You know, a good friend of mine runs it. Right. You know, I think he um, but it's just like but the but the but his. Theory, his assessment, and I have to agree with them, is that the problem is, th- is that we're living in a almost like a gynocentric world order. Mm. If that's makes if that makes any sense, mm. where you can't like ask your wife to you, you know for you to exhibit the jalali almost sometimes could just be spun in the wrong way. You know what I mean? And and sometimes people like you, you, there's horror story, and you probably have heard right, right, horror right. stories where guys are getting divorced and all of a sudden their wife is filing all kinds of like junk with it. Not, 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 not this, not the segue, but I think it just like, there's, it's such a, it's a, to me, it seems like such a mess. And as a father of daughters, right. Mm. I am like, okay, my oldest is 10. What do I need to do to ensure that she has a healthy relationship when that time comes for that? You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think it, it probably starts there, you know, as parents, yeah, uh, because mean, if, if, definitely we, starts if, if we, if we just stress education and, you know, uh, which I think we all want our kids to have education and to be mm. successful, mm. but like, I'm sure you ask any of these, uh, any of the parents of these divorced adults now, guys are, you know, you're here in Chicago, like I'm here 15 guys, 15, 20 years, married, gone, the divorce, right? Right. Parents are still alive, but I wonder what are their parents thinking? Like what's going through? Yeah. Their, their kid was successful, but now they have a broken, their kid has a broken family. I mean, this is a very, very complex discussion, but I think the statement you made, I think it's a gynocentric world, is a problem on two spectrums. One of them is that, bro, the reality is that a lot of the physical and emotional violence, uh, the recipients are women. We see it from our perspective. So, I mean, (laughs) gynocentric world in what aspect is going to be debated, right? What are we saying in in which context? I I feel like it's the culture, right? The example being like, I don't know if it's a good example or not. The fact that a movie like Barbie... Yeah, yeah I it's considered to be main. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. okay. Like, like, like Barbie movies mainstream. Like, uh, like a Rolo Tomasi. You know Rolo Tomasi? He wrote this book called Rational Male. Right, There's right, not right. gonna be a red pill movie like in the theaters. If that makes you. Know, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but what, what, let's let's like temper the discussion in this sense. Right. The problem is that we have an ex- two extremes. I think that are like pushing the narrative. The reality is, I don't think it's necessarily gynocentric in the sense that of the realities that Muslims face mm-hmm. as much as the popular culture that's being pushed on them. The, the rhetoric that the average Muslim girl in the West is being, uh, it's basically, they're being, they're being fed. Yeah. There's a PhD in clinical psychology. Mm-hmm. That's one of my students okay. who said literally the following words. It's a woman. Okay. She's like, I had to undo the Western feminist secularism that was built in me since the time I started studying. Sure. And, my overarching uh, no, friend group, right? And now listen to this: the fact that we had, I had a forceful family that made me turn away from Islam. Okay. Basically, the misogynistic, domineering perspective of faith. 
yeah. from this particular culture and ethnicity, which is most of the Eastern cultures. Right. Uh, and that all pushed me away until I finally came across a, a scholar mm-hmm. which embodied, this is, these are her words, mm-hmm. which embody the prophetic method and the prophetic way of speaking and the prophetic way of discussion, mm-hmm. which brought me back to faith and made me realize through learning mm-hmm. that I have to undo everything I've ever learned. So in, in reality, one of the things that, 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 that she says that I have to question my mentality every time that you're saying something because I've been programmed that way. So I've actually programmed myself to where I say, no, question where this is coming from. You're basically your you're rejoinder, your rebuttal, mm. and then rebuild yourself from there. So it's, it's double jointed. One of them is there's genuine misogyny and ethnic problems and all kinds of cultural uh, infringements and using Islam and weaponizing it against Muslim women. This stuff exists. The, the abuse and violence and, and, and real stuff exists. And at the same time, the onslaught of Western secular feminism and all of that is very real as well, yeah. which is on top of our children. So we're stuck here trying to balance this because we tried to have a discussion. We invited like a panel. Yeah. Uh, Sheikh Muslim Perma was there. Mm. Um, Ustadha Hussein was there. Uh, Sheikh Maryam uh, Amir was there. Yeah. And like I, I was there to, 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 to have a discussion with all of, all of these people who studied like Azhar, right. Sharia, right. right? And we still have people coming and attacking these women saying, no, you guys are basically patriarchally mindly trained, okay. all kinds of craziness. So my idea is that Yes, there is a cultural dynamic, yeah. but it has to be kind of like pushed as a communal perspective. So I, so I think, so it seems like, so, so we're in agreement then that there's a cultural, like oh, yeah. based upon the example, like the whole, the, the whatever, whether it's- fem- But you can't whatever, separate you know, the grievances, bro. You, you can't, okay. That's right. what I'm trying to say. I'm saying, but 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 that con- if that's a societal thing, right. now at an individual level, you have families that have right. misogynist. You know, if they have right. that, right. which they probably, you know, right. dads will say some. You know, I, I um, I was gonna say something. I just remembered. I can't. I'm not allowed to say that. Right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a case study that came in my head, but right. the brother actually told me, "Hey, please don't. Even though you won't name me, don't right, 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 that right, on the right, podcast. Right. Got it. Got it. Like, so it's like you know. Right. I was like, I was like, I was. Some of our dads say some wild stuff. That's all I'll say. Of course, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because that, that's that's what they grew up on. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But like, I think now, but the temper, because but the the culture of the you know the Western feminism is not going anywhere. That's yeah, of course. there. That's yeah. that, that's that's it, and that is a constant variable. Right. So now navigating that through probably like hard line patriot whatever you that turn right. that sister off probably ain't gonna work. But there has to be some kind of like softness balanced going on because. That's not going anywhere. Now it's like, how do we navigate that? So I think that's what I meant by right. that you have that. And so when a person's conditioned by that, by deep, when if that's the environment around you, you're naturally going to lean to that way. And then a brother who's newly married, who's like, doesn't know any better. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's automatically going to, that's going to, it's, it's kind of sucking you, you unless you have a very like, you know, proactive approach. If that makes yeah, sense. I understand. But like it goes on the other side as well. Like a lot of young guys who are influenced by, you know, brother Andrew Tate now, yeah, we have yeah, to say. Right. <laughs> Allah guide us in him. Yeah. And he's still saying stuff that are like whacked out. Right. We got to check the brother. Like, sure. you got to stop. Sure. This is, the problem is that now you're speaking on things which requires Islamic knowledge. Right. And as far as I know, his teachers are still the Dawa brothers on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I know whose teachers are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based on the admittance of like a number of people. Right, right. Bro, have some scholar teachers. People yeah. can check you. Right. You just don't, like some guy who, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, like <laughs> with full respect, have some teachers. Who, who actually can check sure you. so we have still this this main problem and I, wh- people are gonna say you know we just accepted islam and we have to be slow start bro if your money's haram like you got to stop it mm-hmm. at the end of the day like your sources of money right you need to come from halal sources mm-hmm. someone's got to come up with that discussion eventually yeah my, my 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 problem is that again some level of truths cannot absolve like the real problem in like manhood Right, we're not taking, I think, real examples of men, and those men are not on the internet. They're like in maqasid retreats. Yeah, they're in like they're, they're teachers you establish relationships with. Right, they're they're Sheikh Amin. They're those people like you right. can actually sit down, and those people will, and you see how they carry themselves, how they are with their families. Yeah, and they're not sitting there on the computer, man. Right, like that's true. But have you ever asked a kid why they why they're into Andrew Tate? No, of course I have. Yeah. So w- w- what do you think, like? In your disc, in your, you know, when you get the answers, what's kind of the, um, 
Is there a common answer or denominator? Yeah, 100%. You- they yeah. always blame the fact that there's an overarching uh, uh, influence of feminism. Mm-hmm. And the, the truths that and- Andrew T speaks for is because they see the opposite in, in the girls that they deal with. Okay. So uh, the funniest thing was, this is interesting, there was a uh, journalist yeah. who wanted to write about how in- Andrew Tate influences a lot of these guys. Okay. Muslim guys. Yeah. And why. So when I, I heard her, like, uh, essentially the, the story that she was going to write, I told her my experiences. And based on that, she didn't write it. Mm. Because she was she was trying to paint this picture that yeah. Andrew Tate is influencing all these guys right. to basically become more Andrew Tates. Yeah. And if you if you talk to the average Muslim dude who listens to the guy, right. number one, and this is going to sound bad, but half of them are just like, it's entertainment. It's like me watching WWE. Right. So they're not really like, I'm not really fully vested in what everything this guy says. It's right. just entertaining. Right. And you're like, well, you could do something better than watch this guy for entertainment. Others is, they'll say, no, he says some truths. But he just says it in a very crude and like horrible way sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that has a lot to do with how there has been imbalance in gender roles. Mm-hmm. No matter what anyone says on this planet, our faith is a gendered rolled faith. Yeah. Allah gives roles for men. Allah gives roles for women. Right. The end. No one can say otherwise. Right. Anyone can want to write a book. You want to be a PhD in it. Right. Gen- your whole system of framework of thinking yep. is just nonsensical. But a lot of this also conditioned based on context. So how does that work in a in societies where a man and woman both work? Yeah. And the guy has this idea that you know everything I say just goes, bro. Like, and you know this. Like, right. it just this is not the society where it was back in the day where you just basically had full force and pull because you're making yeah. the money and she's taking care of only the kids. Right. So those honest discussions can only happen when we start talking about some of the real problems that exist amongst us as men, mm-hmm. right? I'm talking about genuine issues. Yeah. Like, a lot of it comes from very sexualized, like, objectification rhetoric. A lot of it does come from what you said, a uh, genuine grievance from the impact of feminism on women. Mm-hmm. But if you talk to women, they're like, it's because of you. <laughs> it's because of you guys. What it's a non- the chicken or the egg. The chicken or the egg. So it's the funniest thing ever because... Look, they'll, and the discussions will become very hostile very quickly. Right. Because they'll be like, you're erasing yeah. a very real thing that I face. Like I had a, I had a student, she said that uh, she went to um, the mall with her with her dad. She wears an abaya. Right. Okay, and with hijab. Yeah. And she got catcalled by a guy in yeah. front of her dad. Right. She, like the dad's there and the guy has enough guts to say that in front of his dad. Yeah. So guess what the dad did? Guess Punch, punch the dude? No, you know, I wish, you know, that could have been a better solution. But anyway, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. He basically yelled at her. Really? He yelled at her and said, go sit in the car. And she was like, what did I do? Yeah, you're dressed properly and everything. So, so yeah. what is this going to do? Yeah. Remember, like, to, 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 this happened to you know, other people as well. Right. This notion of, like, women have not being dressed properly at all, all, all no matter what they wear. Yeah. Right? And um, so, I mean, there's a lot of work to be undone. And then a lot of work to, to do on both sides, right. which sometimes doesn't lend to a healthy conversation. Right. What I've found is, you know when minds are changed? In classrooms. In classrooms. People who've studied with me for, for, for a period of time, yep. they've studied Sirah, mm. they've studied Aqidah, they've studied uh, Hadith now, and they're studying Tafsir, they get the program. Okay. Because over the course of this discussion, what happens? Prophetic connection. Yeah. You build trust. Yep. They look at you like you're a trustworthy person. Okay, you're undoing social conditioning that they have. Yeah. So whether it came from uh, the things we discussed, the Salafi circles, or the ultra t- traditionalists. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but did you come from a very uh, ethnically like cultural kind of Islam? Yeah. The social identity Islam, the no Islam, like all of those things, which are socially conditioned, the kind of Islam that you have. We're going to erase all of that, and we're going to build what true Islam is. Mm-hmm. And then now we're going to have these discussions. So, but I think the one thing that I would. Uh, I'm not, it's not this disagreement actually, right, but, but the, but the, the, the thing about, cause I, I really had no, Andrew Tate, like a lot of people, for a lot of people just came on the scene, right? Out of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. Pretty cool. Like some people knew who he was cause of the kickboxing, whatever. Right. For me, um, it's about like when you listen to his long form content, right. like, so me, I'm not, I, I, it's funny cause I actually have told multiple people this, right. um, over the years. Right. I am not like I've never studied feminism that much. Right. It's never really interested me. Right. As far course. as it's a it's a boring topic, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, yeah. say, so it's not like that. You know, is is there other issues? Yeah, sure, there are issues with it, right? But the way I look at it, when I when I looked at when I look at Tate's stuff, it's more like okay, 
I, I observe the articulation in some of these long form interviews right. from a con- holding conversation, but just a ca- personal accountability and has nothing to do. And I think maybe because I'm an older dude versus right. like a 17 year old kid, right. I'm processing it a different way. Yes. There's something very specific. Like I remember something he very uh, profound. He said in his five, one of his five hour interviews I listened to, um, right. I think it was before he became Muslim actually right, right. about like how he he punishes himself if he like loses like a, his keys. If he like you know how you have your car keys, like how organized you are gonna be, right? right? right, right. You gotta be dialed in. Like this idea of because I think people are looking for role models. I, I actually that's that's literally what I was just about to bring up. Go ahead. Yeah. You know because I, I was at the um I I I, I, I met this really interesting brother at Al Maqasid retreat. Right. His name's Dan Henry. Okay. He's a brand new. He's been Muslim like seven months. Oh, he's like one of these multi digital multi millionaire type guys. A long better. Right. Yeah. You know. I like him. Keep keep yeah. keep like basically um, like low key nobody knew who he was. He was just like down to earth kind of dude. But I know one thing I noticed about him was like he was um, we, you know we're at this campsite. It's like a little cafeteria, and people are, and they have different food every day. You know, keep us interested. The dudes eat at the salad bar every every day. day. Right. It's got an apple. It's got his protein shake. There's creatine or whatever. Right. right. Um. And then the last day I'm talking to him and we're talking about like, you know, and he was like, listen, just look, like, why are we eating all this junk? Like, you know, I just became Muslim, but I know that the Muslims of the past were like in shape, mm. right? And like, we got like childhood diabetes sitting on this table right here. We right. got churros right. and all this stuff, you know? Right. And I think people, and I think what's we're lacking is that a lot of younger kids are seeing that like their imams are like either out of shape yep. or they're in in certain fields they're not disciplined and they see a guy who's like jacked right and physically fit yeah and they want to and, and that is a physical whether regardless of what's under the surface yeah, but yeah. On the surface they see this like model of what they want to do i understand so the, the funny thing is i asked this question yeah uh who do you take as role models and why right okay so a lot of the guys they yeah. picked athletes yeah they picked guys like andrew tate yeah they pick basically the images of what they want to aspire to become sure not because necessarily that they are saying the right or wrong thing right. it's just because they've achieved it right so they've achieved uh success yeah in the worldly sense they've achieved it all of these different ways right and women they actually picked people who were there present for them in some form of trust aspect right and it was like an emo- more an emotionally tied thing mm-hmm. who basically would have some physical presence in their life, like an aunt that was there or a person that impacted them in, uh, on, a, on, on, a, on a one-to-one level. Mm-hmm. Very interesting dichotomy, right? But when they mentioned like, oh, I, uh, one of my role models is Kobe because, you know, the Mamba mentality that became famous. It's copyrighted now even, right? Yeah. The idea that you're just so dialed in, you don't go to club, you know, like you just, you have a work ethic that's going to, that, that's bar none. And I said to them very simply, I said, would you take him as a role model in everything? And they're like, after some some back and forth, they're like, no. Because in, in his personal life and private, people are like, he's a jerk and all kinds of stuff. He died, he died either way. I'm, I'm saying in, in terms of the way he was as a person sure. outside of that work ethic, you wouldn't necessarily take as a role model. Mm-hmm. So similarly with like anyone else. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu should be like the ideal, right? And the only reason why we, do, we've, we don't find some kind of like practicality to that because we need something more closer to home. Somebody who's living, somebody who's actually living in this world and kind of like functions in the worldly sense that we can benefit from. So my, my rejoinder is very simple. Take the worldly stuff, but why are you taking all the other stuff with it as well? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's because we're lacking like genuine model, role models. Why do you think like, w- what's the solution for inculcating the connection to the Prophet Sallallahu Honestly, man, I think uh, people just should study the Prophet Sallallahu life more. The more you study about the Prophet Sallallahu life on a real level, the more you'll be connected to him. And I don't mean like I listened to Yasser Qadi's uh, podcast uh, once. Dude, no. Our teacher, Shaykh Ahmed Rashid, said you should be studying the seerah a thousand times until it mixes with your blood. Like, y- you should have synaptic connections being made as life decisions are happening. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? That can only happen if you've, you have such a depth in sila and you've studied it so much yeah. where it's just like part of you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like uh, it, it just becomes normal. Like for example, anything happens in your life, you connect it to something with the Prophet I remember when I was holding my son, man, when, I, when he was first born. Mm. Bro, I couldn't help but remember the Prophet holding his son Ibrahim when he was passing away. I was like, bro, I, I get, I potentially get to, get to see my son be raised. Yeah. That's something that the Prophet was not blessed with. Right. Bro, that was, to this day, it's a very deeply like mm-hmm. sensitive thing because you know you always think about your beloved in everything that happens in your life. Right. And that's why I call the Arturo effect. 
If you remember, for those who have watched Arturo, like yeah. that whole Turkish thing, yeah. one of the most beautiful things in the beginning was, bro, anything that happened in their life, yeah. they would attach it to something with the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Like when they got exiled from the from 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 one place and they had to go somewhere else, right. like, well, the Prophet got kicked out of Me Mecca. Right. It was the crazy, it was the most beautiful kind of like connection. Yeah. So people need an intimate knowledge of the life of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam beyond yeah. it. I listened to one podcast and I read one book and I But I think it comes back to the same the same problem that we have is that it comes down to bandwidth. I, I think it, because you're throwing, we're throwing so many, we have all these now things that people have to learn. Right. Right. And it's just like, and, and, and to me, I, I think it's probably, well, there has to be almost like, and, and I hate to say that right. like life coaching or something has to be a solution because people need no, to know what to do. I was going to come to it. The second portion is the social aspect, which is the community like you were talking about. Yeah. Bro, I mean, full honesty, when you see something like Mashal Maqasid is doing or anybody else, where's our social communities? People are kind of like, more our people our age are starting to attend less in the masjid. Right. We're not divorced. We're not unmasked. Yeah. But we're not just... The masjid has not become a social space for us. Okay. We don't, we don't go there to hang out. We go there for like the event that happens. Yeah. The Sheikh Amin class that, that comes through. Right. Like we're no longer regularly... Which isn't even a masjid, by the way. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So, so my, my, my issue is not... But uh, forget not just the masjid, but I'm saying just a social environment mm -hmm. where we can say like, hey, let's, let's just vibe together. Let's just chill together. Let's get advice from like people like, like yourself. Like you're, you're a story man. You have three kids. So all these guys who are young, they're like, oh man, we don't know where to look for advice. Dude, what are you talking about? Go stay with Maheen. He's yeah. been around for a while. Mm -hmm. That's literally what I would do. I would okay. say, just by virtue of like big brother, younger brother kind of uh, kind of perspective. <laughs> I, I I usually give bad advice. Like you, you, you should just binge entertain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, See, but, but the, you know what I mean, man. Yeah. Like the, sometimes, like these high school. Well, to me, it's like I'm like I, I I'll take it more seriously now. Um, cause the Makassar retreat for me, I think it was really life changing. Right. But before, like, I mean, like a year ago, a 15 year old kid would ask me something and I'm just like, add some Dawah and I'm just like, really not interested. I'm like, kind of like checked out. I'm like, yeah, I'm bored. And right. they would ask me about like some YouTube drama right. and I would just be like, yeah, you should start your own YouTube channel and then also start like refuting them. Right. right, <laughs> right, right. You know, you, you just right. like, it's like, I'm just like, not serious. You know, you, it kind of like a joking way and they kind of right. get it, but I'm kind of like, you know, and I'm like, yo, I'm not your role model, dude. Like, you know, cause people have asked me like, mm. you know, maybe, maybe something to take more seriously. I don't know, but uh, the social responsibility component. Yeah. I'm saying like, these guys are going through something that you, you have to take yourself back to their level. Right. And say, what would I say my, to myself? That's true. Me? Because it's a good point. Because I remember I wish brothers who were, when I was in my twenties who were getting yeah, married. 100%. Advised, like, didn't just say, "Hey, bro, when are you gonna get married? I'm married. I got, you know, right. Tell us nothing, right, about how married life was, right. Probably under this point, this idea of like having like haya, yeah, and therefore taught, and then we have no idea what we're getting into. That's what I'm and all the brothers, all the brothers, like, oh, I gotta get married, I gotta get married. Right. Why are dudes trying to get married? Right. We all know there's why. No emotional intelligence. There's no like. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no maturity, preparedness. You know, I I just feel like there's a lot to digest. I think I I think we're just like slammed, and I think it's goes back to um i and and, and and i'll wrap up with this as my as my point i i've considered that like a lot of this comes down to like band i'll say bandwidth because people yeah. say they don't have time i don't think it's like time i think the the secret what's you putting what you're putting your time into bro. the secret of time management yeah, yeah. i think it's saying no to the right things yeah 100 percent. that's 100 <laughs> you know what i'm saying and also just like d taking the things away that are just that are draining your time yeah. What what is like, bro? I'm uh, let me, bro. Some of these, <laughs> some of these recent YouTube videos of debates are like three hours and six hours. What are you people watching? <laughs> what in the world are you watching, bro? Right. I'm, and I'm I'm being full honest. I'm a sports guy. I love yeah. sports, yeah. right? But I'm 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 sitting here in front of you. I don't remember the last time I watched a full football game anymore. Mm -hmm. I really don't. It's been like 10 years. I really? have not watched a full football game. Who's your team, by the way? Uh, bro, I don't want to talk about it. Cowboys? <laughs> no, no, for, for sure not. No. Packers, I, my, my name is uh, on, on fa fantasy football, Packers PTSD. So it's like... You know, somebody told me that Jordan Love looked really good. Who? Jordan Love, he's a new Packers yeah, quarterback. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm completely... Bro, I'm, I was in the days of Brett Favre. So like, like, <laughs> Brett Favre, Robert Brooks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so the, like, for me, certain things, not just because I don't like sports, I just... There's, th there's things that took priority. Yeah. You know what I mean? And even then I should be prioritizing things even more, you know what I'm saying? Than, than, than I am now. But my, my point is that comes through what? Like just social development. You've developed personally yeah. to understand there's certain things that are more, a bigger priority. Right. And you're going to, and you know that when you're young and all of a sudden you become married, you'll start, you're going to start reeling that yourself.
Mm-hmm. But you need a little bit, a hand of, a, of an elder brother kind of just pushing you along. Right. If we don't have those social spaces to do that because we're our, in our own enclaves of like talking about what the, what the dramas are, we're not going to benefit each other in that sense. Sure. Because um, it's not, I, like what you're saying is 100% true. People have bandwidth issues. Yeah. There's only so much time in the day. And also, you also need re- to relax, right? Yeah. Um, but I think if we just start creating um, things that, that people can, uh, resources that people can actually go into where it just feeds them a good foundation, they can get it done over a, a longer course of time mm-hmm. uh, of substance. Learn substance and it will, it will, you all automatically take away like all these bite-sized reels, all these bi- bite-sized Instagram this and yeah. TikTok that, which people are consuming. They're not consuming like substance information. So to me, it's just like give people substance, and that's what our institute does. That's Legacy Institute. That's what that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build like a foundation of that. Okay. And is your website finally live? Yeah, it's finally. I remember like five years. No, so like I'll, I'll you know the funny this is the yeah. second recording we've done. Yeah, yeah. But this one we'll see the live. Oh yeah, that one died. That one died. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know, we were yeah. like, what is? I, I, I think, yeah. but I, I think you were ready at one point, but we had moved studios twice and lost the files. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> it was probably for the best, bro. <laughs> Yeah, right. so for those who don't know, it, like Sheikh Hasib and I, we, we, we're mad mumluks, but we, we used to host there. This is totally, this is September of 2016 at yeah. Al Maghrib Home Fest. That's the first yeah. time we met. That's so funny. We did a recording, and the idea was like, you, you I yeah. think the I was going to go live that year or two yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, wait for it to go live. I'm like, all right, no problem. We're live for five years after that. Yeah. <laughs> it took a minute, and we're just like, yeah, so, all right. Well, <laughs> Hasib, Jazakallah khair. Much um, appreciated. Um, I know it's been a long day. When did you fly in today? You phone this morning. I remember, yeah. You don't know, uh, you know, know. nine forty or ten. You got a full weekend of teaching, and yeah. you're on what? You, well, you're in Michigan. You're in Eastern time, right? Yeah, That's where so. your brain. So you're not. Mm-hmm. I was like, I thought you were coming from the, the West Coast or something. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know. So, um, and then Legacy Institute is where people can reach out to you. Yeah, inshallah. We we teach classes regularly. The idea is to teach Islamic literacy and the development of the sciences. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more coming, but you know, we're just trying to not rush it. But but I think people ha- want to like. I think you offer a lot of wisdom as far as like how people can navigate like these very personal situations. Yeah. Right? And if is that something you'd consider? I don't. I don't want to say again. Get a life coach or nothing. Well, like the one I'm, I'm full honest with you. I have a problem charging people for this. Yeah. I really didn't. I'm not saying anything against who people who do. Yeah. But like to me, I haven't done it because I don't want to charge people. My time is expensive. Right. If I were to charge, I'm going to charge you something you can't afford. Right. So we need an institution that will charge people less, and then I can get my fees. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I don't think there's enough time in the day for me even to to be able to like coach people. Right. Mm -hmm. What I think is these conversations, there needs to be a series of conversations about very real topics that can people can listen to jive with. Yeah. And then maybe take some live questions on that can further like develop those things. Right. Because by the way, this this has happened. What I'm talking about has happened in Arabic. Right. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed Hassan Dadu Shaqili. He did a series uh, called Mm Mafahim, like understandings. And it was all about this stuff. Like what is Islam's true understanding about music? And he would drop it, man, like things you never heard before that exist in our tradition. Is it, is it a still a live ongoing series? No, no, because certain political issues and stuff like that. But So is it available? It's available online. It's called Mafahim. Why don't you Online. translate it? Oh, man, that's a... <laughs> or, or just, or, again, we got to learn, well, learn Arabic. I'm contemporizing and, it. I'm not yeah. trying to say, like, re, reproduce uh, those discussions. No, but I'm saying, like, yeah. for us to access, because I, I think there's so much out there... Learn Arabic. ...that we just don't... Yeah, learn, learn Arabic and learn it, because I, because I, I just think so much of it right. is... There's stuff that we haven't been exposed to. I I, I asked one of my teachers six months ago, right. um, Sidi Mustafa Azam. Right. You know, I was like, he has a huge reference to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Almost he, and every time he says it, it's like Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa you know, the he, the full every single time. Mashallah. And I'm like, this guy when you when I first met him like last fall, Sheikh Hamza brought him to Chicago. Mashallah. No, I mean, sorry, he was here for a wedding, and Sheikh Hamza introduced us. Right. Um, I was like, this dude, like, and he, 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 you know, and he was like, because he did the whole bird dut in like the English prose. Yeah, I remember. You know, so I asked him six months, like, shit. I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like, uh, CD, like, how do you, um, you know, you know, how do you inculcate this love? And he was like, you, I mean, he was like, man, the only, the only thing I can tell you is like, I don't know if it's for me. I think it's getting around people who are the lovers. Yeah, that's not right. The social, the social. And the social I think community. that goes back to it. And then I experienced that at, at, at the retreat and right. whatnot. And you're like, all right, now I kind of get it. Yes. But now it has to be cultivated more and more. 100%. Right. Because you, because when you feel it, every, everyone who's been to like Hajj or Umrah right. knows that when they're there, right. 
they're like spiritually dialed You're clocked in. in. Yeah, they're yeah, clocked yeah, in. Yeah. They're like not thinking about the you know another dunya stuff, right. all their fahisha and stuff, whatever right. whatever right. issues they've got. Right. You know, they're it's like gone. Right. And eventually, the idea is that you got a moment, you got to, but then they come back and they you lose dial in it. those moments and throughout your period of life by channeling what you feel experience in that. Right. So now it's just like I, I think the key is really you know getting those experiences, but then finding like substantive like systems yes that you plug into yes that don't let you go yeah and, and this is a lifelong project based yeah. on what you have time and available right and exactly. like you said I, I, the most important thing is, is creating a social community man like right and i think one thing i was talking to Ustad amjad tarsin about and i'll, yeah. I'll, and I'll, I'll try to close this podcast in the last 10 minutes but <laughs> i was like there should be a book that, you know there is a because he was given he was he was teaching this book right. uh about Being the Muslim. dawah yeah of Habib Omar, like right, right. Habib Omar wrote a book about like how to give counsel. It's like super right. practical, Marshall, right? right? It's a little pamphlet. That's great. And I'm like, dude, how do you like if I can incorporate this in the workplace, right? Like management, That's leadership, good. in corporate yeah. America, right? It's a like game changer, right? 100. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he was like, yeah. I mean, a lot of people said that this is like the there's like some sister came up to him and was like, you know, I've been to all these leadership seminars, and this like trumps it all. 100%. You know what I'm saying? So I think we got to go there. So, Sheikh, I, I won't keep you longer. Exactly. Um, you know, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at info at sultansandsneakers.com. If you want to support the channel, you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash sultansandsneakers. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and leave a comment. If you're listening on the audio platforms, please leave a please um, leave a five-star review for my special guest, Sheikh Hasib Noor. I'm your host, Mahinda Podcaster. Signing off. Assalamu alaikum.